Good morning. Many thanks to Greg Dolan, Gal Luft, and everybody who helped organize this important conference. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, but long after I'd accepted your kind invitation, Secretary Chu decided to travel to Japan this week, and my job requires me to be there with him. So I'm taping these remarks on Monday morning, 24 hours before you'll see them, and just before getting on a plane to Tokyo. I hope that even though these remarks are on videotape, they'll help set you off in a good direction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in recent months, the cost of gasoline has caused hardship for millions of American families. One reason for that hardship is that there are few substitutes for gasoline available to most drivers. Indeed, 95% of the energy used to move our cars and trucks comes from one source, petroleum. That doesn't seem odd to us. We grew up in a world in which that's just the way it is. So did our parents, so did our grandparents. But it doesn't need to be that way. There are other ways to move our cars and trucks, including with natural gas, which is now at its lowest price in the US in more than a decade, with electricity and with biofuels. Change won't necessarily be easy, it rarely is. But ending oil's near monopoly on the transportation fuels market would pay dividends on many fronts. Today, I'm going to start by describing President Obama's historic leadership on these topics. Then I'm going to summarize the basics on methanol for those who may not be familiar with them. And then I'm going to discuss the opportunities and challenges in widespread use of methanol as a transportation fuel. And I'll close by briefly, briefly suggesting some next steps. In this year's State of the Union address, President Obama said, quote, we need an all-out, all-of-the-above strategy that develops every available source of American energy. As the President has emphasized, there is no silver bullet and no single answer. We need a sustained approach that includes the full range of American energy. Under President Obama, domestic oil production is going up and our foreign oil dependence is going down. We're also taking far-reaching steps to improve fuel efficiency and diversify the fuel mix in our vehicle fleet. In May 2009, for example, President Obama announced national fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas standards for cars and light-duty trucks, the first meaningful update to fuel efficiency standards in decades. In July 2011, the President announced the next phase in the administration's program, proposing standards under which average fuel efficiency will nearly double reaching 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025 and saving drivers roughly $8,200 per vehicle. And in August 2011, the administration finalized the first ever national fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas standards for heavy duty trucks. And that's just the beginning. The Recovery Act signed by the president in February 2009 included $2.4 billion for batteries and electric drive vehicles. In part because of these Recovery Act investments, battery costs are expected to drop by half between 2009 and 2013. And under the Recovery Act, we're establishing 30 major manufacturing facilities for batteries and components for electric drive vehicles. To develop next generation biofuels, President Obama set a goal of breaking ground in at least four commercial scale advanced biorefineries by 2013. That goal has been accomplished one year ahead of schedule and U.S. biofuel production is today at its highest level ever. Earlier this month, the President announced a new $1 billion National Community Deployment Challenge to catalyze up to 10 to 15 model communities to support deployment of advanced vehicles at critical mass. This fuel-neutral approach allows communities to determine if electrification, natural gas, or other alternative fuels would be the best fit. These are just some of the steps that President Obama has taken. And, and ladies and gentlemen, let me add that even in this election year, I believe this is a bipartisan topic. I don't know Americans of either party who think we should be more dependent on foreign oil. Republicans, including Senator Richard Lugar and Senator Lamar Alexander, have shown important leadership on this topic. Working together across the aisle, I believe we can make a difference for the American people. So let me turn to methanol. As many in this crowd know, methanol is the simplest form of alcohol and one of the oldest industrial chemicals. It can be made from a variety of feedstocks. In the 19th century, methanol was made from wood, and it's still sometimes called wood alcohol. In the 1920s, the process was developed to make methanol using natural gas or coal. And today, methanol is a widely used industrial chemical. At the end of 2010, there were over 245 methanol plants worldwide, 
with production capacity of over 25 billion gallons per year. That's the equivalent in volume to roughly 1.6 million barrels per day. In talking about methanol, I found that many people ask, are methanol and ethanol closely related? After all, their names are very similar. The answer, as many of you know, methanol and ethanol are both alcohols with many of the same physical characteristics, such as look and smell. Methanol is primarily used to make industrial chemicals, and it's very toxic. Ethanol is found in many alcoholic beverages, and it's safe to consume in moderate amounts. Both methanol and ethanol can be used as fuels and in solvents. Now, methanol is slightly more corrosive than ethanol. It has a little bit less energy content. Methanol has about half the energy content of gasoline. Ethanol has about two-thirds. So, could we use methanol to drive our cars and trucks? The short answer is yes, but that would require investment and planning. Methanol has many attractive features as a transportation fuel, and let me talk about some of them. First and perhaps most important, methanol is inexpensive to produce. At today's low natural gas and high oil prices, methanol could help reduce fuel costs consumers pay at the pump. In the U.S., natural gas now costs a small fraction of crude oil on an energy equivalent basis. So finding ways to convert cheap natural gas into liquid fuels could be a promising strategy. Methanol offers one way to do that. At $4 per million BTU, which is more than the price of natural gas in the U.S. in recent weeks, methanol can be produced at well under $1 per gallon. At such low prices, methanol could help bring down costs to drivers. A second advantage, methanol is a liquid at room temperature. It doesn't need to be compressed or liquefied, as natural gas does when used directly as a transportation fuel. Furthermore, methanol can be blended with gasoline. Third, methanol can be made from many feedstocks. As I just noted, methanol can be made from natural gas, offering a potentially promising way to use the United States' cheap and abundant natural gas supplies to power our vehicles. Methanol can also be made from biomass and other renewable sources through a number of different conversion processes. This has the potential to substantially reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of methanol consumption as compared to methanol made from natural gas, depending on a number of factors including the type of biomass feedstock, how the biomass is produced, and how the biomass is converted to fuel. However, production of methanol from biomass is not currently economic. Methanol can also be made from coal, although doing so without carbon capture and storage results in greenhouse gas emissions substantially greater than those from conventional gasoline. So a fourth advantage from methanol is a transportation fuel. Methanol is a high-octane fuel, which means it will produce more power from an engine than gasoline. That's why methanol has been used in motorsport racing. Indeed, for all these reasons, using methanol as a transportation fuel is not a new idea. During the 1970s, in the wake of the Arab oil embargo and Iranian revolution, methanol was discussed as a possible alternative to gasoline. In the late 1980s, interest in methanol as a transportation fuel peaked, mainly as a way to reduce urban air pollution. As a result of Clean Air Act requirements, by the late 1990s, roughly 100,000 barrels a day of methanol was being used in U.S. vehicles. Not directly, but as a feedstock for methyl tertiary butyl ether, or MTBE. This ended when MTBE started showing up in groundwater supplies and several states banned it. Which brings us to some challenges to be addressed in considering strategies for using methanol as a transportation fuel. Let me talk about four. First, methanol is more corrosive than gasoline, which means that most cars on the road today could not be driven on it except in very low blends. For a car to be manufactured in order to take fuels with a high percentage of methanol, Minor changes would need to be made, including a stainless steel fuel system, wear-resistant piston rings, and fuel sensor. Estimates of the costs vary, but are generally in the range of a few hundred dollars. For a car to be retrofitted with this equipment would cost more. Now, one implication of the foregoing, it could take a decade or more for half the cars on U.S. roads to take methanol in high concentrations. Last year, new cars made up roughly 5% of the vehicles on U.S. roads. Even if every new car sold in the U.S. were methanol compatible starting tomorrow, it would be at least a decade before roughly 50% of the vehicles on U.S. roads took methanol. Second, methanol has half the energy content of gasoline. 
Although methanol is cheaper than gasoline on an energy equivalent basis, the fact that it has half the energy content means more frequent refueling for drivers using methanol. A third challenge? Clean Air Act regulations restrict how much alcohol can be used in gasoline. Since ethanol already comprises about 10% of U.S. gasoline, the room available for more alcohol, such as methanol, is limited. Furthermore, because methanol has a lower boiling point than ethanol, additional equipment may be needed to ensure that methanol-compatible vehicles can operate properly in cold weather. And additionally, methanol blended in, into gasoline has different distillation characteristics than ethanol gasoline mixtures, so additional work may be needed to ensure that evaporative and cold start emissions of methanol vehicles can meet current and future vehicle emission requirements. Now, none of these issues are showstoppers, but they present challenges that must be considered and addressed. A fourth and final challenge is refueling infrastructure. As with ethanol, methanol cannot currently be transported through petroleum product pipelines due to its solvent properties and solubility in water. Like ethanol, methanol would need to be transported to terminals closer to retail locations and blended into gasoline during final delivery to retail locations. In addition, we'll need widespread availability of methanol at service stations. Many service stations have only two tanks for gasoline blends, one for premium grade octane gasoline and the other for regular grade octane. Methanol blended gasoline won't be able to occupy either of these tanks. This will require fuel retailers to either purchase separate tanks or pumps or retrofit existing ones. Furthermore, M85 would need to be priced at a level that attracts consumers with vehicles capable of using it. Initial sales volumes of M85 for retailers will be lower than that for gasoline because of the initial limited demand due to slow fleet turnover, and that could present challenges. There may be room for methanol to fill the low-level blend space based on current natural gas prices and investment costs. However, if natural gas prices increase substantially and price differentials between methanol and gasoline revert back to historical norms, the economics could be more difficult. So in conclusion, methanol offers a number of important advantages as a transportation fuel, including low cost, the ability to blend it with gasoline, and the fact it can be made from many feedstocks. However, there are important challenges, including the need for changes to the vehicle fleet, emissions issues, and investments required in refueling infrastructure. All these issues would benefit from further discussion among experts and stakeholders. As part of our all-out, all-of-the-above strategy, methanol can play a role. At the Department of Energy, we're planning additional research in this area. Among the topics, what's the potential for short-term displacement of petroleum with methanol worldwide? by blending methanol at low levels into liquid fuels or with other strategies. How can some of the challenges that I've just discussed best be overcome? We're eager to work with you and others in exploring these topics. We look forward to the results of your discussions today, which can help guide our work program. Many thanks to all of you assembled at this conference. Good luck in your discussions. I look forward to a report on the outcomes.